Hello, my front porch friend. Come walk with me down this old dirt road back here in these back pastures. It's the first day of fall. You can feel it in the air more than anything else. I just feel the presence of God back here with me today. I've had a word in my spirit for you. I hear the Lord saying to somebody today, get your eyes up. Get your eyes up. What are you facing? What is it that you're looking at? Are you looking today at a situation that seems in the natural to be utterly impossible to fix? It may be in your body, or it could be in your family, or someone you love, your children. Just circumstances that are just looming larger and larger and more impossible, it seems, than ever. Yet, I hear our God telling us, today, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Whatever it is today you're looking at, I do not care how impossible it looks or how long you have been dealing with it. God is greater. Just start saying that out loud. God is greater. God is greater. Even if you're looking straight at the circumstance, you just got off the phone with it today. Just start saying it out loud. God is greater. God is greater. Start looking up at where he is. He is high and lifted up far above all powers and principalities and every name that is named, including cancer, including COVID, including family strife or marital impossibilities. He is greater and he is higher. He is wisdom and he is revelation. God is greater. God is greater than this spirit of division that's trying to divide your home and steal from you. All of us are in a battle today. All of us. We are battling an unseen enemy that's out to try to steal from us, to steal from us our children, our homes, our peace, our health, our joy, our strength, and especially our faith and authority. But we don't have to let him have it. And we're not going to. But I hear the Lord telling me, some of you have been battling what is a spiritual war. It's almost like spiritual ground warfare because it's earthly. It's, it's based in this earth realm. You're dealing with circumstances that in the natural looks like it's just ground warfare. But it is actually a spiritual battle. But the Lord reminded me to tell you today, my dear sweet friend, do not fight spiritual battles with natural weapons. We talk about it a lot, don't we? Natural weapons will not destroy a spiritual enemy. That's why in the word, he tells us in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. Our weapons are in God. Now, when I say don't fight a spiritual battle with natural weapons, you say, well, Miss Karen, what, what is a natural weapon? What do you mean? Well, I, I hear this in my heart for some of you today. A natural weapon is whenever we get in the flesh dealing with a spiritual enemy. Because the flesh will never win against a spiritual enemy. Whenever you're, you are battling with, instead of... Um, Instead of standing in faith, you are battling in with fear. In other words, whenever, even whenever you are dealing with people and you're arguing and you're do, dealing with ground warfare, person to person, you're trying to talk to them on the phone and getting nowhere. It's just, it's stressing you out, filling you with anxiety. And you're trying to speak your side and they're speaking their side and you're not getting anywhere. You're, you're dealing in the, in the natural realm with actually what is a spiritual battle. 
You can't fight it that way. Arguing is not going to win this battle you're in. You can't argue it out. You can't reason it out. You're dealing with spiritual warfare. What's another natural weapon? Agreeing with the enemy. Whenever the enemy's telling you all this junk that you've been getting on the news, you've been getting uh, at work, you've been hearing it from family members, you've been hearing it coming to you from all sides, a natural report. Don't agree with the enemy. If it's opposed to this word of God, anything that comes to you that is contrary to what God has told you, do not agree with it. You only agree with what God has said to you and what he has said about your situation. Don't agree with the enemy. Let him know too that you don't agree with him. You tell him when the enemy comes at you with his report, say, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I see what you're doing. I hear what you're saying and I do not partner with you, nor do I agree with you. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that you have given us authority over all the power of the enemy. Thank you, God. Jesus said that, honey. He said that he's given us power over all the power of the enemy. He didn't leave out one. How else do you deal fighting with natural weapons in a spiritual war? I'll tell you one of the main natural weapons we're pretty familiar with using. Worry. Worry. Worry is a natural weapon that accomplishes nothing. Worry is a thief because it robs you of your peace. And see, your peace in God is a weapon in itself. You wouldn't think of peace as being a weapon. But it is. We've talked about that before. Because in Ephesians 10, Ephesians 6, chapter 6, verses 10, when he begins to list the armor of God, peace is one of the weapons he mentions that we use. Peace is a weapon because peace, having peace in the middle of conflict is because you have put your trust in God. In other words, peace is a fruit or a result of trust. Oh, see, honey, peace comes to us when we meditate on what God has said. Worry is what comes when we meditate on what the enemy has said. I will say that again. Oh, oh, oh. oh, peace comes and faith whenever we meditate and we think about what God has told us, worry comes and fear when we meditate on what the enemy is telling us. You got the phone call. You had the child saying stuff to you. You had your husband saying stuff to you that hurt your feelings. You had people at work saying stuff. You've been listening to the news. You've been listening to what the people of the world and all around us is saying right now. And you just sit around thinking about it. And you just meditate on it. And you just think about, oh, how impossible this is. Oh, and you know what you do? You just find yourself saying, oh, things are just getting worse and worse. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what to do. Well, instead of saying that, honey, that's just meditating on the report of the enemy. That's just sitting there thinking about what he's saying. Then you call your friends and you tell them what the enemy said. Why don't you just turn it around and call your friends on the phone and tell them what God said? So come on, just start getting with people who only want to hear what God is saying. Don't talk to people who love to talk about what the devil's saying. I don't want to talk to people who love to hear what the devil has to say. I want to get with people who love to hear what God is saying. Oh, I love to tell people that. Even when I sit with them in a coffee shop sometimes or in, at the ramp, I just love to look at people and just tell them. I just, first thing I love to say to people is what you're hearing from God. What you're hearing from God. What's God saying to you? Oh, my sweet friend. That's how fear is destroyed. It's when you start meditating on what God has said in your situation. That's what destroys the enemy. Thank you, God. Because one word from God, just one word from God, is so powerful that it annihilates. 
plots, the plans, and the lies of the enemy. Jesus said that Satan is a liar. He's the father of lies. Jesus said there's never been any truth in him ever. He, Jesus said everything he says is a lie. So when you're worrying, you're sitting around meditating on a lie. He's, he's trying to get you to believe the lie because then he has something to work through to manifest the will of the enemy. Oh, I'm not going to do it. Oh, I'm not going to do it. Oh, I'm not going to do it. We're going to meditate on what God says because when we speak God's word out of our mouth, it's the same as though it were coming out of God's own mouth. That's how powerful his word is. So you just sit around meditating on what God says. And then you start speaking what God said and you say it and you believe it in your heart. And then that's when things start moving and lining up with God's will because God's will is God's word. That's what you say today. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. See, we're not the first ones that dealt with that voice of fear. I was reading today in the book of Daniel, third chapter, and uh, there was three young men, three of my favorite characters in the Bible. Can't wait to meet them someday. And the Bible says that the king then, Nebuchadnezzar, you know this story well. Let's just talk about it together right quick. So Nebuchadnezzar, as you know, he, he builds this statue and he tells all the people of the nation, he says, I'm going to build this. I built the statue. Of course, it was, it was of himself. And uh, he builds this statue and he tells them, he says, whenever you hear the music, then you bow. And uh, it's basically in worship to him. And I feel like some of, some of you right now, that the enemy, I heard this strange word today for somebody, that the enemy has been playing his satanic mantra. It was an odd word to even hear, mantra. I even wrote it down in my, in my uh, notebook. That the, that the enemy's been playing a satanic mantra for people. I even went looked up the definition of mantra because I thought, what does exactly that mean? And, it, mean, and it, it was an interesting thing. I should have a notebook with me. But it says that it is a repeated sound or phrase or incantation. Yeah. Where, the, where it's just this repeated phrase of meditation. Well, of course, Whenever it's meditating on the word, I guess a mantra can be good. But it's often used by the, even the enemy in different religions and spirits that are not of God and where they repeat a sound and a phrase or incantation. So I feel like the enemy has been somewhat playing his mantra, his satanic lullaby, his satanic sound. For some of you that's been listening to his music, to his sound, to his words, to his voice, even in the night, his tormenting voice, the lies of the enemy coming through people, even whether it's doctors or people or family members. Or I, he, can, he can speak in pretty interesting places sometimes, the mantra of the enemy. And so Nebuchadnezzar <coughs> tells the children of Israel, or tells all the people, including the children of Israel that, was, that were there in captivity, when you hear the music, the mantra, you are to bow in worship. And you know what happened. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow to the sound of the music. So they get called in before the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, and he goes, now look, boys, because he actually liked them. And uh, he says, listen, boys, I'm going to give you another chance. He evidently, you didn't understand this. So we're going we're to try this again. We'll play the music again. I just, what I need you to do is I need you to bow as soon as you hear the music. I love, in fact, it's so good. I'm going to stop right here. Hang on. I'm going to stop right here on the ground. And I'm going to have to read this to you. It's just that good. Listen, I think I've still got it from today. I do. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Look at this. It's right up here. Okay, first of all, can you see it? Let me see. If, let me move my, my ribbon. Right there it is in the bottom. Cedric, Meshach, and Abednego, rep, Abednego replied, to, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. <laughs> Listen to this. They said, If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. Now watch. He will rescue us from your power your majesty, but even if he does not, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, look right here, 
even if he does not. We want to make it clear to you that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Look at that. I, I just, I, I find this so powerful. First of all, they tell King Nebuchadnezzar, you know what? There's no need for you to even give us a second chance. Don't even, don't bother. Because number one, the God that we serve, he is able to deliver us from your fire. Second of all, he will deliver us. And third, even if he doesn't, we will not bow. <laughs> I find that so amazing. In fact, we talked about it last week on the word that they basically said he can, he will, but if he doesn't, there's so much in that because I hear three things for you. He can means that's my hope. He will deliver us. That's my faith. But if he does not, that's my trust. So they had hope, faith, and trust. That's what God is calling you today too. In the middle of the situation that you're fighting today, he is calling you to a place of hope. He can. Faith, he will. And trust, but if he doesn't, I will not bow to fear. I will not bow to the plans of the enemy. I will not bow in my standard. I will not bow in my convictions. I will not bow in my faith. I will not bow to the desire or the mantra of the enemy. I will not bow. I have hope in my God. I have faith in my God and I have trust in my God. He is worthy of all three. And then the Bible says, he went ahead and threw them into the fire. He did seven times hotter. And you know what happened? Nebuchadnezzar jumps up when they threw them in. He said, just a minute. He said, didn't we just throw three men? into this fire. They said, we did, okay. He said, but I'm looking through the flames. I don't see three. I see four. And the fourth one looks like the Son of God. And some of you today have been listening to the voice of the enemy telling you that you've got to bow in your faith to his mantra and to his lies. And yet today you are standing, knowing that to stand is going to cost you something. And Peter calls, oh, you know what? I'm going to have to turn to this. I hear this word over somebody right now listening. Peter says that the trying of your faith is a very fiery trial. And some of you today feel like you've been thrown into the fiery trial. And Peter says here, oh, I love the way this opens in 1 Peter, the first chapter and the sixth verse. He says, so be very truly, he says, so be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead. Did you hear that? There's joy ahead for you. Even though you may have to endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire test and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. My friend, I pray to God that you're hearing this word today because your faith is not going to bend. It's not going to bow. It's not going to fail. You have hope he will, he can. You have faith he will. You have trust that even if he doesn't, my faith will not bend on my faith in God. Even when I understand him and even when I do not, I will trust him. That is the fiery trial that even if I don't understand, I will not bend. And even if it costs you the fire and you've got to go into the fire with your faith and your fire, the faith in your heart today is being tested in the fiery trial. In the fiery trial, the beauty of this is that your family, your co-workers, 
your spouse, your children are going to look into the fire that you are in because they know you're there. They see what you're going through. They're going to look into that fire and they're going to say, wait a minute. I thought that was just my mother in there. Wait a minute. I thought that was just my grandmother walking through that fire, but I don't just see her. I see somebody else in there with her. Come on. And he looks like the son of God. You're not in this fire by yourself, honey. You may feel alone, but you are not alone in this fire. This fire is testing your faith. But when your faith comes out, it's going to come out as gold. And it will be a testimony to your children, to your children's children. It will be a testimony to your family. It will be a testimony to the world. And it will bring great glory to God. Great praise to our Father. Lord, I pray for my friend today. Standing in the midst of the fiery trial. I pray today, God, that you will give her a fresh resolve. That she will not bend. I pray that today hope is exploding in her. That you can deliver this. You can deliver her family. You can deliver her children. You can bring her prodigals home. And that you will do it, God. That you can heal. That you will heal. But God, even if it doesn't look like what we thought then, Lord, we can put our trust in you that even when we don't understand what's going on, you can be trusted to bring all things together for our good. That even in this fire, our faith will come out as gold and you will be glorified. We live for you, God, don't we, honey? We just live for him. He's worth everything. He's worth everything. And he's what we live for. And he's worth it. I want you to comment below and let me know what you hear, what you need, what your prayer requests are. Let me know what God is doing in your life. Or let me know how this word spoke to you today. I'm encouraged by that. I love you. You're not alone. There's a lot of front porch friends with you, standing in faith with you and beside you. And you matter. We support each other even in these comments. It's our point of agreement. It's our place of faith and agreement that we pray for each other. So make sure you comment below. Let us pray for each other. Let this be a week of great, 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 great miracles in Jesus' name. So my friend, be strong. Keep your eyes on him. God is greater. I love you. I'll see you again next week. All right? Till then, bye-bye.